One of the many uses for the discrete Fourier transform is to compute the spectrum of signals that have been sampled. So we're going to learn how to use the DFT to find the spectrum of discrete time signals, which we've denoted as x of f hat, also to find the spectrum of continuous time signals, x of f. And this involves scaling the frequency axis as well as scaling the DFT coefficients. So recall that the DFT represents a time signal x of n as a weighted sum of complex sinusoids whose frequencies are harmonic or integer multiples of 1 over n. The weights are the DFT coefficients xk. So we're going to derive a spectrum from xk. And of course, sampling will be involved if we use a continuous time signal. So we also have to factor in the impact of the sampling interval t sub s. Now there's a couple key facts for finding the relationship between the index of the DFT coefficient and the frequency in the spectrum. First of all, it's to observe that x of k is associated with a complex sinusoid whose frequency is k over n cycles per sample. So xk occurs at a digital frequency f hat k of k over n. And continuous time frequency f is f hat times 1 over t sub s, where t sub s is a sampling interval. And that's measured in units of hertz. So the coefficient x of k has associated with continuous time frequency f k, which is f hat k times 1 over t sub s, or 1 over t sub s is equal to the sampling frequency f sub s. So combining these two terms, we have that xk is located at frequency k divided by n t sub s hertz. Now another fact that we're going to make use of is that the DFT coefficients x of minus 1 is equal to x of n minus 1, and similarly at minus 2 is the same as n minus 2. So I've drawn this picture here that shows that these coefficients map to these negative indices for k. Now the picture I've drawn assumes that n is odd. As we conventionally draw the spectrum in terms of negative and positive frequencies. And the negative frequency information is embedded in the upper half of the DFT coefficients. So in this graphic, we're showing the various axes and their corresponding labels. So I have k, the DFT index, and that's going to go from 0, 1, 2, up through n minus 1. Then in terms of digital frequency or discrete time frequency f hat in cycles per sample, we normalize k by capital N. So I'm going to have 0, 1 over n, 2 over n, and so on, up to n minus 1 over n. And then to convert that to hertz, we can divide by t sub s, or equivalently multiply by f sub s. So in terms of hertz, our DFT coefficients are located at 0, 1 over n t sub s, 2 over n t sub s, all the way up to n minus 1 over n t sub s. And because the upper half of the DFT coefficients corresponds to the negative frequency DFT coefficients, we can map those down here. And we have in terms of discrete time frequency, negative 1 over n, negative 2 over n, and so on. And in terms of continuous time frequency in hertz, we have negative 1 over n times t sub s, negative 2 over n times t sub s, and so on. So the spacing between each DFT coefficient is 1 over n cycles per sample, or 1 over n t sub s hertz. Now 1 over n t sub s is the same as f sub s divided by n. Now the case that I've shown here is for n odd. If n is even, and we use MATLAB's convention, which is to map the coefficient at n over 2 over to minus n over 2, then we have the diagram shown below. The DFT coefficients are spaced by 1 over n cycles per sample, or f sub s over n hertz, and in this case, since n is even, the DFT coefficient at n over 2 maps to a discrete time frequency of 1 half cycle per sample, and that maps to f sub s over 2 hertz. And again, we're taking this upper half of the DFT coefficients, and we're using those to get the DFT coefficients at negative frequencies.
Now there's also the necessity for converting the amplitude. We can see that by taking a signal which is just a complex sinusoid at frequency L over N and has amplitude A, and the spectrum of this signal would have a coefficient A at frequency L over N. If I expand X of N in terms of the DFT, we're going to write it as a weighted sum of complex sinusoids whose frequencies are K over N. So the way that this sum down here is equal to X of N is by setting all the XK equal to zero except when K is equal to L. And that reveals that A has to be equal to one over N X of L. So if I have the DFT coefficients X sub L, I'm going to divide by N to get the amplitude of the discrete time signal spectrum. We have to scale the DFT coefficients by N, the number of samples. It's a consequence of the way the DFT is defined with having this 1 over N factor. So we're going to illustrate this now with an example. I'm choosing a continuous time signal X of T being equal to 2 cosine of 20 pi t plus pi over 4. We're going to use a sampling interval of 1 over 50 and collect 50 samples, so that's a total of 1 second. In that case, x of n is 2 cosine of 2 pi 10 over 50 n plus pi over 4. And I can write that as a sum of two complex sinusoids whose frequencies are 10 over 50 and minus 10 over 50. So in this form, we can read off the discrete time signal spectrum. It should have a magnitude of 1 at minus 10 over 50 and a magnitude of 1 at 10 over 50. So here is the magnitude of our DFT coefficients. I see that I have a coefficient of amplitude 50 at k equals 10 and another one at k equals 40. So the coefficient k equals 10 corresponds to this frequency of 10 over 50. I've taken and am showing the DFT coefficients after scaling the amplitude by n, so I'm going to divide by 50, and that gives me a value for the spectrum of 1, and then I'm going to find my discrete time frequency in cycles per sample. F hat is going to be k divided by n, so this large component at 10 is going to correspond to a discrete time frequency of 0.2, which is identical to 10 over 50. So now we'll take the upper half of the DFT coefficients and move those to negative frequency and display the spectrum from minus 0.5 cycles per sample to 0.5 cycles per sample. And you can see that what happened was this large component that was at 0.8 now is mapped to negative 0.2 cycles per sample, which corresponds exactly to this complex sinusoid with frequency negative 10 over 50. Now finally, we can map this to continuous time frequency. And so now I'm showing the magnitude of the spectrum X of F, and we've obtained the frequency axis by taking discrete time frequency F hat, dividing by T sub S, or equivalently multiplying by F sub S, and we see that what was at 0.2 when I multiply by 50 or divide by 1 over 50, that goes to 10 hertz. And then I have another one at minus 10 hertz, which agrees exactly with our intuition from the cosine, which has a frequency of 10 hertz. You'll notice that the amplitude of the cosine was 2. So the spectrum of the cosine, if we did a Fourier series, we would expect to see a coefficient of 1 in magnitude at 10 hertz and at minus 10 hertz, and that is exactly what we obtain by taking the DFT coefficient, scaling the axis appropriately, and normalizing the amplitude of the DFT coefficient by n. So we'll consider another example, which is very similar to the previous one, except instead of having a frequency of 20 pi times t, we now have a frequency of 21 pi t, or 10.5 hertz. And we'll again use n equals 50 and t sub s equal 1 over 50. And one thing that you notice is that 10.5, the frequency of this sinusoid, is no longer an integer multiple of 1 over n t sub s. So the DFT is trying to express this sinusoid using a sum of complex sinusoids, but the available frequencies don't correspond to the frequency of the sinusoid itself. So instead of having just 
two non-zero coefficients, we're going to expect to see a lot of non-zero coefficients. So here's the magnitude of the DFT coefficients, and then we've scaled these by 50 in amplitude and mapped the axis to continuous time frequency as well as taking the upper half of the DFT coefficients and shifting them down to negative frequency to obtain the spectrum. And you'll know that the large amplitudes of the spectrum occur at frequencies 10 and 11 hertz, which are on each side of 10.5 hertz, the actual frequency of the cosine. Here's another example where we have a sum of two sinusoids. The first one is a cosine with frequency 10 hertz, and then the second one is a sine whose frequency is 25.9 hertz. Now you'll also note that the amplitude of the sine is four times as large as the amplitude of the cosine. We are going to choose n equals 200 and t sub s equal 1 over 100. So this means that the sinusoids being used by the DFT are integer multiples of 1 half hertz. So the 10 hertz sinusoid should show up at a DFT index corresponding to 20, because 20 times 1 half gives me 10 hertz, while the 25.9 hertz sinusoid is not an integer multiple of 1 half, so we're going to expect to see a lot of terms associated with approximating this one. The peak amplitude should correspond to a DFT index near k equals 52, because that would represent 26 hertz. Indeed, we have a coefficient when k is equal to 20 that is a single coefficient, and that corresponds to this cosine. And then the sine, which we can't express using a single component of the DFT, requires a large number of non-zero coefficients. The amplitude is roughly four times. So now we've taken the upper half of the DFT coefficients from 100 to 199, and we're mapping those to negative frequencies. We've scaled the axis, and we've divided the DFT coefficient amplitudes by n, which is 200, to obtain our DFT version of the spectrum. And you can see that we have a component at 10 hertz and minus 10 hertz, and the amplitude of that component is slightly bigger than 1 half. Now, we, it should be exactly one half if it was this cosine alone, but we have this other sine who's using all of the DFT coefficients in general, and so that biases the amplitude a little bit. And the sine term shows up at close to 26 hertz. This peak value has a frequency or an x value of 26 hertz, and the amplitude is about 1.9 roughly four times the amplitude of the cosine term.